All right, so it's just after two. We see people are still joining the meeting um, and thank you to start. Um, I'm David DeWitt, I'm the Trade Relations Manager for the Oregon Wine Board. And we're joined today with Bree Stock, our Director of Education. And we're really excited to start the first of our series of webinars leading up to Oregon Wine Month. Um, we will be uh, watching the questions as they come in and looking at the Q&A in the chat. So we'll, we'll get to all that. Um, we're just gonna give it a couple more minutes for folks to join. Um, and, and while we do so, I thought I'd share a couple of stats or some fun facts rather about Oregon. Um, Oregon is the 33rd state to join the union. Um, we were declared a state February uh, 14th, 1859. Coincidentally enough, uh, the state flower is the Oregon grape. Here's my little joke for the day. Um, our bird is the Western Meadowlark, which was voted by school children in 1927. And the, the state tree for Oregon is the Douglas fir. Um, so just wanted to let a few more folks join in before we get rolling. Um, and to answer that first question, MW stands for Master of Wine. And Bree, when, when she introduces herself, she'll, she'll probably touch on that as well. Let's go ahead and start the slides, Bree. Okay. Um, so as you all know, your devices are muted and we will be looking at the Q&A in the chat um, and we'll try and answer them best we can as, as they come through. We'll also leave a little bit of time at the end for some, some question and answers. Um, additionally, for those folks that aren't able to join live, this webinar and all six of them will be posted on the website showed there. Um, so you can go back and re-listen um, or if you can't join us live, You'll, you'll find the recordings there after each presentation. And yes, each uh, seminar has its unique own registration. So you have to sign up for each one individually. Thank you. Um, additionally, some of the stuff, some of the slides and information that you see here are also available on our resource studio. And that link is, is there. We'll share it with you later on in the presentation as well. Next slide, please. Um, and the webinar series is all in appreciation of Oregon Wine Month, um, which is celebrated annually in May. And we've been doing it since 2012. So this is kind of our 10th anniversary, if you will. And it's an opportunity for us to encourage um, increased support from distributors, from restaurants and retailers across the country. Um, we do this to, to stimulate promotions and sales throughout all trade channels. Um, and ultimately, the goal is just to develop a deeper affinity for Oregon wine um, with the consumer. Um, folks are, are quieted, so the Q&A will just through the chat. Um, everybody is muted. Next slide, please. And uh, our, our guest, Bree, who's uh, joining us today from wine country, a, a blustery afternoon here in Oregon. Um, is our Director of Education and Master of Wine. And Bree, please take over. Thanks, David. Uh, welcome everyone to another uh, series of webinars for Oregon Wine Month. Um, there's a couple of questions going on in the chat about audio and yes, uh, all attendees have been muted, but please um, do put any questions into the chat and I'll be sure to answer them. And David is going to monitor that um, while, I, while I'm presenting as well. So he'll throw questions out at me just in case I miss any. Um, and Mark had a really great question about what does MW stand for? Um, it stands for Master of Wine. It's um, uh, one of the highest qualifications in the wine industry. It's similar to a Master Sommelier. However, Master of Wine is a qualification that extends from the business aspect um, through vineyard, uh, viticulture, enology, um, trade, uh, consumer, 
um, journalists, there tends to be um, no one uh, shoe that fits um, a Master of Wine qualification. So Masters of Wine will be in many roles in the wine industry, um, from viticulture through to enology, sales and marketing, journalists, educators, um, and we often wear many hats. So I uh, am also the education director at the Oregon Wine Board. I also make wine myself um, and have worked in pretty much every facet of the wine industry from being on the floor as a SOM um, to sales and marketing and importing and distribution. And yes, I am from down under from Australia. So um, hello to everyone over there. If anyone is up really early and watching this, uh, let's get started. We're going to go into a little um, overview of Oregon wine for this uh, seminar series. We are going to go deeper into each region of Oregon wine as the series progresses. So please, um, if you're curious about the new and upcoming regions in Oregon and how they differ from say the Willamette Valley or Oregon as a whole, um, please, please join us for the, for the next seminars as well. And we have, oops, I went way too far then. <laughs> so Travel Oregon likes to say that there are seven wonders of Oregon. Columbia River Gorge, Crater Lake, the Painted Hills, the Oregon Coast, and Smith Rock and the Wallowas. But we believe that there's an eighth, and that is Oregon wine country, where you can find a world of wine within our state's borders. And each region is uh, not only a great hospitality region, but each region makes fine wine and has uh, a lot of other um, activities that you can engage in as well while you're here. So it's a really great place to come and visit and spend a week or a long weekend. So getting started here, how does Oregon make such great wine? So violent beginnings really did lead to the creation of unique and uh, fairly um, interesting soils that are perfect for fine wine creation. So millions of years ago, the tectonic plates collided, the North American and Juan de Fuca plate collided, um, sending part of the uh, of Oregon that was underwater, pushing it way up into um, now being above ground. So prior to that, the Pacific Ocean uh, went all the way inland to Montana and everything um, when those plates came together and smashed, got crunched and pushed up together. What this also did was cause a series of volcanic reactions where the Cascade Ranges and the Coast Range were all um, established at this time. So lots of volcanic activity happening. Um, and so now we have our two major soil series in, the, in Oregon, which are uh, volcanic basalts and the marine sedimentary soils. Uh, from this, we also had a series of uh, ice ages and Missoula floods are the largest floods that occurred over about a 50 year period um, that filled the Columbia Valley uh, from Montana through Canada, Washington and the Columbia Gorge and actually carved the Columbia Gorge um, and the Columbia River. So that's what you can see there in that picture is this area in the Columbia River that was carved and um, created through all of this um, ice age floods. It was sort of like a bathtub where the ice for it was frozen and then would thaw and some would be released. And so the ice would fall down again and more would scrape through that valley, taking with it uh, all types of different rocks and volcanics and um, alluvial stream sediments as these masses of water flooded down into the Willamette Valley. So that's the creation system for uh, the soils of Oregon, mainly volcanic basalts, marine sedimentary bedrock and uplifts, and then alluvial gravels um, and loose soils from the dispersion of uh, windblown uh, volcanics down the Columbia River Gorge um, and into the North Willamette 
and then alluvial gravels and bench lands in southern Oregon um, and the east of the state where there's uh, meandering river systems that seem to form and then move and form and move again, leaving behind all of these really interesting cobbles and really uh, free draining soils that you know vines love. Vines don't like to have their feet wet for very long, um, especially during the growing season, which makes for a lot of vigor in the canopy. So a lot of the soils in Oregon um, are just that perfect level of being water holding enough that we can get through a lot of the growing season without irrigation, and then free draining enough that they're not creating too much vigor um, and disturbing the vines. So along with those geographical landmarks of Oregon, the Pacific Ocean borders us to the west, um, to the east is Idaho, and the major um, influences here are the low-lying coast range that buffers up against the Pacific and helps prevent a lot of um, Pacific Ocean influence coming in, um, really protecting the Willamette Valley uh, and Southern Oregon to some extent with the Siskiyou Mountains from too much of the violent cold Pacific Ocean weather. Uh, although it's not doing a great job today because it is really, really windy and nasty out there today. Um, the Cascade Range is actually a very high mountain chain, a very high volcanic chain that, that really raises um, up to the eastern boundaries. And as such, there's really not a lot of Vitus vinifera that can be grown on the eastern side of the Cascades without it them being um, hybrid varieties. So really the ideal areas for um, Vitus vinifera growing at the moment are within the Willamette Valley and the Southern Oregon AVAs, which is what you see on screen here, going from the Columbia River in the north of the state, which splits Oregon from Washington, um, and where we actually share um, an AVA. So we share the Columbia Gorge AVA, the Columbia Valley AVA, and Walla Walla Valley AVA with Washington. And we also share the Snake River AVA with Idaho. So we're one of the few states that shares AVAs with, with other states surrounding us. Part of what makes grape growing so successful in Oregon, despite being a relatively cool northerly climate, we are situated between the 42nd and 46 degrees north parallel of the equator, which allows us to have a really long extended growing season during uh, the summer months, during that growing season. So in the summer, we'll often have 15 hours of daylight during the growing season. So not the uh, sun doesn't set until nine or 10 in the evening. And so our grapes get not only uh, warmth from the sun and from that summer weather, but we also get a high level of UV input as well. Both heat and light are required for uh, successful ripening of grapes. And it's also why a lot of grape varieties in Oregon, uh, we can have more than 80 grape varieties planted uh, from Pinot Noir through to Cabernet Sauvignon, and all of them ripen because of this uh, extended UV and daylight hours. Although we're not gathering as much um, ripeness and high alcohol as some other areas uh, in the world where they're just being warmed by the sun. So rainfall in Oregon is another uh, reputation that Oregon has for being typically very rainy, but that's really only just uh, in the winter months. We usually start to dry out in June and then July, August, and usually most of September are pretty dry. And so that's the crucial growing season um, when we really have very clear blue skies and really lovely warm conditions. 80 to 90 degrees um, is typical for your um, daytime temperatures in July and August. What we also have during this time is um, high diurnal temperature swings. And what I mean by that is that our daytime temperatures are quite warm and then our nighttime temperatures really drop down quite low and so help to preserve freshness and acidity in the grapes that we're growing. And so for this reason, we have very bright food friendly um, styles of wines being made. 
And Oregon wine is thriving. It's, ten, it's expanding everywhere across the state. Um, Willamette Valley is the largest growing region, but Southern Oregon is definitely um, expanding swiftly, as is the Walla Walla Valley. So areas to keep an eye on are along that river system in the north, the Columbia River, the Columbia Gorge, Columbia Valley, and Walla Walla Valley ABAs. And then, of course, Willamette Valley and Southern Oregon. Both Willamette Valley and the Southern Oregon AVA are quite large AVAs. Willamette Valley is three and a half million acres in size and Southern Oregon is two and a half million acres in size. So there's plenty of land that can still be explored and grown into, um, whether that's along the valley floors, the hillsides or higher elevations for certain grape varieties. So we've really only begun to scratch the surface on what can be grown here in the Willamette Valley and in Southern Oregon uh, and all over Oregon for that matter. Uh, we have nearly 1,000 wineries. I'm sure from the 2021 report, we'll be up above 1,000 wineries. Um, and we have nearly 1,400 vineyards in the state. Uh, most of our wine growers are fairly small and the majority of our industry is, is under 5,000 cases. So 70% less than 5,000 cases per year, and we produce 1% of the fine wine produced in the US. So we're a fairly uh, you know, small uh, player on the, inter on the uh, national wine scene, but we're growing swiftly and uh, our reputation for high quality um, overshoots just that 1% that we are, um, you know, spent that, that we're known for. Uh, define fine wine. Fine wine, typically, if you're going to go by a retail perspective, is anything that's above um, $12 a bottle. Um, so premium, premium wine production. Um, and so most of the producers are very hands on 80%, higher than 80% of um, the grapes are hand harvested and made in small production facilities. Um, so it's a very high, high touch uh, wine, wine, um, uh, wine industry here. We have 21 unique growing regions that continue to expand um, every year. So an AVA is what we define our growing regions as. So American Viticultural Area is what that stands for. And each of these are a combination of climate, topography, and specific soils that really define the aromas and flavors of the grapes and the wines crafted from them. Uh, the other is uh, the hand of man or the cultural terroir that is um, often, you know, miss, uh, not really spoken of. So there's a collective consciousness that goes into creating premium wines um, in Oregon. Uh, the state of Oregon, as you can see here, are all of our AVAs spread out. Um, the North Willamette has a number of uh, nested AVAs. So now there are 10 uh, nested AVAs and primarily these are situated just uh, within around an hour um, south and west of Portland, um, the major city in the state and just north of the capital Salem. South of the Willamette Valley, we have the Southern Oregon ABA, which has a, a several uh, nested ABAs as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Southern Oregon ABA is situated between the Siskiyou Mountains and the Cascade Ranges. And this area here is really uh, not so impacted by the volcanic basalts, but is mostly marine sediment and alluvial soils. And the regions here are really based around river systems. Um, and we will talk more about these as we go into the individual seminars um, on each of the regions. Uh, as I mentioned also, uh, we have four cross-border AVAs. So Columbia Gorge, Columbia Valley, Walla Walla and Snake River Valley. So Oregon's top varieties. Pinot Noir is the predominant variety grown in Oregon. The state's diversity of geography and microclimates and aspects, uh, like I mentioned, between the different elevations, 
the varied soil types, the different aspects um, do make it well suited to many different varieties. And there are more than, it says 70 here, but I believe there's more than 85 different varieties now grown in Oregon. It's hard to get a um, true number on that, um, but it's changing all the time as more and more um, clonal selections and grape varieties are brought into the US. And it's really only limited by the creativity of our growers and our winemakers. So diving into the largest production grape grape variety, Pinot Noir, still Oregon's flagship variety. And um, in the 60s, when the variety was first planted, it was first planted in the Umpqua Valley in Southern Oregon, and then spread a few years later to the Willamette Valley. It was planted along with several other grape varieties, including Riesling and Chardonnay, Pinot Gris, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, um, and a plethora of other varieties. So Pinot Noir was uh, planted among a series of others, but it was really in um, the 1975 bottling of um, the Irie Vineyard um, that really uh, won its um, favor at an international competition and started to turn the eyes of the US and the world onto Oregon for Pinot Noir. And so most growers tended to continue to plant Pinot Noir and it's had a uh, really healthy and exceptional quality level um, from, from Pinot Noir in this valley. It's a thin skinned grape variety uh, in, in Oregon. And so it's useful that uh, we have fairly short summers, um, but fairly warm summers that can ripen the grape variety to its full prominence without a lot of um, rot or other um, influences coming in to um, diminish the quality of the Pinot Noir fruit. So hey, we have a, a couple questions mm -hmm. pop in. Sorry to, right. to stop you there, but um, some questions regarding the fastest growing varietals, um, which uh, you'll probably touch on with Chardonnay, especially as that's continuing to become more popular. Um, and then also some climate change uh, effects specific to different regions in Oregon are some suffering more type of questioning. Okay. Uh, yeah, so there, so there are a number of varieties that are growing in prominence, um, particularly Chardonnay. Um, Pinot Noir is still the number one planted grape variety, though, so that continues to be planted at a rate of knots that um, outweighs any other grape variety. Although within um, the Willamette Valley and Southern Oregon and Columbia Gorge, AVA, uh, and also Walla Walla, um, Syrah is really on the rise and seems to be the variety that's the second in step for um, greatest um, plantings. Chardonnay is a uh, close second to that variety. And then there are a handful of other varieties um, specifically within the Willamette Valley that are really um, starting to see some, um, some grounding. So Gamay Noir, of course, um, Trousseau Noir, uh, Elagote, Cabernet Franc, um, there's even Menthea planted now. So there's really only uh, a limit of, of, like I said before, the, you know, an ability for what the grower is um, able to stomach and what the market can demand. Um, what other questions were there? David, were there any specifically that you saw? Um, I think you'll probably get to this, but uh, Pinot Noir is an expensive grape to grow. Um, it, it ages in oak um, for a long time and usually, you know, newer, more expensive French oak. Um, but there was a question about why prices are, are typically high for good Pinot Noir and seem to be going up in price. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, Pinot Noir is a variety that tends to be um, fairly early budding and um, it is often uh, higher priced because it's harder to get reliable yields off of Pinot Noir. So a typical yield for Pinot, Pinot Noir would be two to two and a half tons per acre. Um, in many other regions for other varieties, you're looking at triple those tonnage rates for even the you know, premium um, Cabernets and Syrahs that are made. So Pinot Noir tends to be very low yielding. 
um, Oregon in itself is a fairly, um, you know, labor intensive growing region. And for that reason, with labor costs um, going up, land costs going up, and also all of, you know, everything along the supply chain increasing, um, it generally tends to be a fairly high priced region to grow, to grow grapes and grow wine. And that's why Oregon tends to be positioned at the very high level, that premium wine level. There's really not a lot of Oregon wine that you can find for below $12 or $15 a bottle. Um, and so that's why that there's so much you know, um, higher price points in Oregon wine. Um, there's also, along with the nested ABAs, a lot of the, um, the grape growing tends to be on hillsides and not on the valley floor. And so that also, again, limits the vigor um, and what you can mechanize uh, when you're on a steep hillside. So you can't really use a lot of uh, machine harvesting. It's, it has to be a lot of hand picking fruit. Um, and so very labor intensive, um, you know, region for, for production. And then also it's still a relatively small um, growing area. So, you know, 30,000 30, acres planted uh, in all of Oregon, you know, there's some wineries in California that have, you know, 30,000 acres just for them, for their own production. So, you know, Oregon tends to be very small producers or fairly small producers in comparison to the global um, wine market um, and, and high-end production. Uh, and yes, um, <laughs> Burgundy is on the same latitude, um, similar latitude, um, but the differences between Burgundy and Oregon are, are vast and probably the only two similarities are that we grow Pinot Noir um, and the latitude. The soils are completely different. The growing season is completely different. Burgundy has uh, rainfall and cloud cover throughout the growing season. Um, the only other thing um, is that, you know, it's a small production region, um, more or less. So um, some similarities, but, but not a lot. Uh, so as I mentioned, the grape variety was first planted six, just over 60 years ago in the Umpqua Valley. And you can see these are two of the oldest vineyards uh, for Pinot Noir in the Willamette Valley, um, the Irie Vineyard and David Hill Vineyard. And you can see the types of weather that come in through the coast range and sit in the valley here. Um, there are a handful of own rooted vineyards left that were planted in the 60s and 70s um, and 80s here in Oregon, but most are now on rootstock because of phylloxera and all plantings since the mid 90s have, have always been on rootstock. So really um, protecting these old vine vineyards is something that's very important um, and to the history and pedigree of this valley. Uh, and also seeing how the climate is, is altering and changing and where uh, production is moving to for Pinot Noir and for fine, for, um, fine elegant Pinot Noirs as well. Uh, Pinot Gris was planted among the first varieties here in Oregon as well, and it really was the first um, Pinot Gris in the U.S. to be commercialized um, and, and sold throughout the U.S. So the early Willamette Valley wine growers um, really developed the market for Pinot Gris in the U.S., and that market um, today is still the number one grape variety for white wine production here in Oregon at 14% of plantings. Uh, and it's primarily grown in the Willamette Valley um, and in the Southern Oregon AVAs of the Umpqua and Northern Rogue Valley AVAs. So a lot of um, canned wine under Pinot Gris, you know, there's a lot of outdoor activity here. And especially in the summer when the days are so long, we spend a lot of time at the rivers, lakes, hiking, biking, um, and at the beaches. And so canned wine has really taken over here. And Union was one of those 
first companies to invest in canned wine, high quality, sparkling um, and still table wines um, in a can. And that market has really exploded here in Oregon and with good reason. Um, and then there's also King Estate, which is I think the largest producer of Pinot Gris um, in, in Oregon uh, and really spent a lot of time developing um, the market and brand for Pinot Gris and high quality traditional more Alsatian style of Pinot Gris where it's much more uh, rich orchard fruit flavors and um, some complexity, um, creamy um, complexity from Lees. And then there are new producers uh, to the Valley who are also experimenting with Pinot Gris. Um, who are making it in a skin contact style and making a light red from it. Um, the grapes for Pinot Gris are fairly dark pink in color. And when you ferment them on their skins the same way as you would a Pinot Noir, you um, are left with a really lovely and quite different um, uh, orange wine or skin contact, um, a skin contact style of wine. So there's, uh, while the grape variety isn't continuing to be planted so much in the Willamette Valley, um, there's a lot of producers who are really trying to protect the original old vine plantings of Pinot Gris and trying to celebrate whatever this grape variety can be um, in this area, knowing that it's expensive to farm and to make wine here in Oregon. Um, so really trying to elevate the status of this grape variety by reimagining its position in the marketplace. Uh, okay, moving into uh, actually, are there any questions in here, David, that we should answer? Uh, yeah, there's a question so that awesome. just came up yep, regarding yeah. the French style. Yep. Yeah, I think I think you hear about them being produced in a in a French style um, simply because. Pinot Noir is renowned for being from Burgundy. That's its spiritual homeland. Um, and, you know, many winemakers here have, have done the, um, you know, the harvest in Burgundy. Um, there's a lot of uh, Burgundian producers now that are actually investing in the Willamette Valley. I think there's at least a dozen producers now. Um, Burgundian producers, French producers who've purchased land here um, and are making Pinot Noir here. So I think that, you know, the combination of it being a French varietal Pinot Noir um, and a cool climate style um, in comparison to the other growing regions on the West Coast here, um, it really gets referenced as being in a Burgundian style. Um, and the wines, you know, of both Burgundy and here have a lot of elegance and freshness um, and, and I'll have a lot of savory character to them as well. So I think that's one of the reasons that we hear um, so much the comparison to Burgundy in, in terms of a French style. Um, not so um, high in alcohol and fruit forward and, um, and you know, very fruity styles of wine as you find in some of the warmer West Coast um, growing regions. We've had a couple of questions too, Brie, regarding the fires and how that affects wine. Um, mm -hmm. oh, boy, if, if I knew the answer to that, um, you know, and had the had the answer to that, uh, I, I would be uh, a millionaire. Um, you know, we're learning all the time how wildfires impact um, wine growing. Um, what we've seen uh, recently is that it depends on the proximity. Um, of the fire and smoke to the grapes and to um, what type of uh, grape variety is growing closest to that and also the ripeness levels um, of those grapes at the time when the fire comes through. Um, so, there's a, so there's a lot um, that we don't know, uh, but we're learning all the time and hopefully we don't learn that quickly. <laughs> hopefully nothing comes through uh, this year. But yes, it's definitely a concern and there's a lot of, um, USDA agricultural monies and grant funding going into understanding how um, smoke impacts grape quality and also trying to come up with, um, you know, ways to remove it or mask the smoke in certain um, wines as well. 
Um, and I don't know the percentage of wine that's being dumped. A lot of people didn't make wine um, in 2020 if they were close to the close to the fires. Um, but I don't have any numbers on what's what's been what hasn't been sold or what's been dumped. Uh, what we do know, however, is that white grape varieties are not overly impacted by wildfires. And this could be one of the reasons why Chardonnay is on the rise here as well. Um, we are finding that the grape plantings of Chardonnay have doubled really um, in the last five years uh, or less. And we're still seeing more and more plantings all the time of Chardonnay happening. Um, the main region for Chardonnay is the Willamette Valley. And what we're starting to find here is that um, the varied selections of clonal material and also um, exposure to new elevations um, and different sites has really allowed Oregon Chardonnay to start to be dialed in and making some really uh, complex and uh, age-worthy styles of Chardonnay. <clears throat> So it is grown all over the state and it really does change in profile from where, where it's grown. So the level of ripeness and of course, also the style of the producer. We uh, you know, often talk about Chardonnay being the winemaker's grape um, and it really does you know, depend on, on their um, you know, selections for, for what they're, you know, making the Chardonnay into. Are they picking it still um, very ripe in more of an orchard fruit or tropical fruited style? Um, is it barrel fermented? Is it stainless steel fermented? Uh, in Oregon, there's been a move towards earlier picking and also higher elevation sites and also clonal material that gives you some variety in the ripeness levels of the berries. So much more complex complexity um, being given by, you know, different pick dates, uh, and then also aging as well. So typically barrel fermented in oak barrels, uh, not so much batonnage anymore, but just full uh, fermentation in oak barrel. And then after um, a series of months in barrel being moved to a stainless steel tank um, with all of the lees to age on lees um, and what we call a tightening um, is, is happening. So um, really, bringing focus into those Chardonnay styles through new production methods. Uh, and we're also, of course, making sparkling wine uh, from Chardonnay as well. Um, and it's interesting to note that, you know, although Southern Oregon uh, is producing a lot of um, Chardonnay, Pinot Gris and Pinot Noir, most of the fruit from the Southern Oregon AVA is um, shipped north uh, to larger producers up here, such as A to Z and Union, um, who do make, uh, and Acrobat, who make an Oregon appellated um, wine that you're most likely going to see on your BTG pours. Um, and so a lot of that fruit, um, riper styles of fruit, um, are being used to bring some complexity and also to bolster uh, the number of the amount of Chardonnay that's available in the Willamette Valley. Um, but you're going to continue to see um, a big increase in Chardonnay uh, through, from the Willamette Valley and from Oregon as an appellation uh, moving forward. Uh, I think the reason for that um, is that there's a, a higher price point allocated to Chardonnay and also a higher quality position. Um, and so you can get uh, a lot more, um, you know, uh, better economics coming from planting Chardonnay um, instead of planting Pinot Gris, which tends to be made in, uh, you know, a fresher, earlier drinking, high volume, um, crisp, um, apple and pear fruited style um, that there's also a lot of competition for Pinot Gris coming from outside of, of the US as well. So I think it's more just um, that, you know, Oregon winemakers a definitely have found a passion for Chardonnay in recent years as well. Um, but also it's, it's, you know, it makes sense from a market position and it also fits with the Pinot Noir narrative. Um, and Burgundian narrative. 
And so here you do see some of, this is the Eola Amity Hills um, in, in Oregon in the Willamette Valley. So it's just in the North Willamette, but in the Southern part of that North Willamette. Um, and it generally uh, sees a lot more impact from the maritime Pacific Ocean influence, um, really coming in through the, that coast range, um, causing um, Chardonnay that has really vibrant, bright acidity and tends to slow down in ripening. So we're able to get grow really complex styles of Chardonnay here um, and we also have better access to different um, oak regimes and oak barrels available to us um, and the winemaking you know the collective winemaking around Chardonnay has really been um, shared a lot and um, an interest that's growing swiftly and we're going to I'm not going to get too into Chardonnay here because next week's seminar we will have um, some amazing winemakers on the panel who will talk about the rise of Chardonnay and along with the nested, the new nested AVAs and what that means for Pinot Noir and what that means for Oregon as a whole. So there's going to be a much deeper conversation around Pinot Noir and Chardonnay on next week's um, seminar. So be sure to register for that and join us next week for that. Uh, how much Pinot Meunier is planted? Very little. Um, I know that there are a number um, of producers who are um, excited about Pinot Meunier and we are trying to get um, as much planted as we can because there is a huge um, sparkling wine and traditional method sparkling wine um, push um, at the moment and making some really interesting um, method champenois styles. Uh, but Pinot Meunier is, is um, not highly planted here. So there is an increase in interest from both growers and winemakers. Um, and I think, you know, we're ultimately limited by what the nurseries can produce in terms of um, plantable material. Um, and so that's just, you know, it's going to take a lot, a lot to, um, to build that presence in, in, um, in Oregon. Oh, what's the most obscure grape type? I don't know. It, <laughs> that depends. There's everything from Riccatzatelli and Mencia and um, Saparavi grown here. So there's there's a lot of um, interest in, in different varieties here. So there's a lot of obscure grape varieties that are grown and native grape varieties for other regions. Syrah is something that is on the rise here in Oregon and that we're all pretty excited about. Um, surprisingly, there's a fair amount of Syrah planted in the Willamette Valley. Um, and it really does make some really distinctive styles of grapes um, and wines here. So Walla Walla Valley, the cross-border AVA that's shared with Washington um, has nearly 400 acres planted and 220 acres um, are in Milton Freewater, which is the net new nested AVA that's within the Walla Walla Valley. Um, I'll talk a little bit about their soils in a moment uh, when I flip over, but there's also a thousand acres in Southern Oregon and so uh, we're generally uh, really looking to these two regions to lead the charge for high quality, um, really complex styles of Syrah here. And they do tend to be still um, very cool climate styled Syrahs. So you can see in that top image, um, these are the cobbles that are in the um, alluvial riverbed that is um, the rocks district of Milton Freewater. And so these um, cobbles serve um, two purposes. They heat up the ground and uh, in a fairly continental and cool climate region, um, these rocks really help to stabilize and warm the vineyard soils. Um, and then through the growing season, project that heat back onto the grapes during the evening when the temperature can drop by 40 to 50 degrees overnight. So um, those rocks and cobbles are very important for also um, evapotranspiration, so not allowing um, moisture in the soil to be um, evaporating out of the soil, so helping to retain um, soil moisture in these areas as well. 
and it makes a really um, distinctive type of Syrah. There's um, people are playing around with different clonal selections, but there's a distinctive character to the Rocks District and to Walla Walla Syrah um, in that uh, it's a riper style than is found in most other regions of Oregon. So it's um, fleshier, it's higher in alcohol, um, it has a lot more grilled meats, um, savory, meaty elements, cracked pepper, salt licorice, a lot of umami and iodine flavors uh, in the Syrahs from the Rocks District. And they are incredibly long lived and long aging as well. So they're uh, a real treat, but there's uh, not too much of them being made. So um, really good to seek out and they tend to be, you know, at a very high price spectrum as well. Um, in the um, bottom image, you have um, an image of Cowhorn Vineyard in the Applegate Valley. Um, this uh, has Syrah that is head trained here, um, as well as um, BSP trained. And Southern Oregon's Applegate Valley, which is a nested ABA that's based around um, a, uh, the Applegate River, which um, again has sort of meandered and, and shifted over time so that the bench lands that these vines are planted on um, and some other vineyards such as Troon um, are, are planted on were actually ancient uh, river beds and so they're very free draining they have a lot of um, rocky gravels um, and again using those um, uh, the rock elements to heat up the soil um, in, a, in a pretty cool growing area um, the Southern Oregon and Applegate Valley, the Rogue Valley and Applegate Valley AVAs are fairly high elevations. So a lot of the vineyards start at 15 and 1600 feet elevation and go up to um, 2400 feet elevation. So very high elevation, a very cool um, diurnal um, temperature shift. So hot days, often around 90 to 100 and then dropping down um, to, you know, in the 40s and 50s in the evening. So what that does is really preserves this very bright fruit character um, and the acidity and allows, allows the vines to rest um, and sort of wake back up again for that morning ripening system. So you end up with very elegant styles of Syrah. Um, again, in an old world style. So they're not fruit bombs. They tend not to be um, so bombastic styles of Syrah um, and they tend to have more moderate alcohol levels and be very elegant. Um, they're a real region to watch for Syrah down there as well. So keep an eye out for that. And then in the Willamette Valley, um, it's made again in a very similar elegant style. So lots of violet florals, um, cracked pepper, a little bit of bacon um, and raw meat characters, but very much a cool climate style of Syrah found in the Willamette Valley as well. And then finally, Cabernet Sauvignon is um, a variety that we don't normally think of being associated with Oregon, but there's a decent amount of it planted here. So um, around uh, 1500 acres in total. <clears throat> The grape variety is increasing uh, and it's primarily grown in the Rogue Valley and also in the Walla Walla Valley. Um, and again, these wines are, you can see the uh, similarities between some of the um, regions between Walla Walla and the Rogue Valley. You tend to find um, vineyard plantings on the valley floors and the low lying foothills um, and the higher elevations are too cool for a lot of grape growing. So so really um, a lot more of a bench land, um, alluvial riverbeds and um, sloping gently hills uh, than what is really found in the Willamette Valley where vines tend to be planted on relatively steep slopes and high hillsides. So Cabernet in Oregon, again, like Syrah, like Pinot Noir, uh, you know, the cool climate characters are still present. So you do get a little herbaceousness coming through on the Cabernets. Um, you do get cassis and much more elegant blue and 
plum and black fruit flavors um, at fairly moderate alcohol levels. The tannin profiles can be um, very compounded because of the diurnal temperature shifts and what tends to be fairly small berries. Um, on these on these clusters and on these bunches. And so a challenge for winemakers is often not over extracting. So being quite gentle in the fermentation and handling of Cabernet Sauvignon in both Walla Walla and the Rogue Valley to create elegant styles. Um, but the combination of bright fruit flavors and um, compounded tannins and bright acidity really make for a, a Cabernet that is a little more claret in style uh, or Bordeaux in style that has a little bit more elegance and freshness and also again is very food friendly and can age very well. Uh, and again we're going to go into uh, all of these areas much deeper uh, on their own as we look at the individual AVAs. So make sure you register for the upcoming seminars and some of these will have winemakers in them, grape growers, um, and they'll be sharing uh, what attracts them to certain regions and some of the challenges and styles of winemaking that they're really exploring and excited about in Oregon today. Uh, finally, Oregon has a huge commitment to sustainability and a lot of um, integrity to its um, community and people. Um, LIVE certification uh, stands for Low Input Viticulture and Enology. And this is a third party um, certification that was actually created um, about 20 years ago uh, here in Oregon uh, to uh, give both growers and wineries um, a guide or a roadmap to um, creating a very holistic and regenerative um, uh, vineyard system. Um, and so it's one of the few certifications that actually considers um, the forest and the growing regions around um, the, the actual vineyard itself, and also considers the workers' health um, and the, uh, you know, the rivers and um, salmon, salmon safe, the rivers and systems that come off of, um, you know, wineries and vineyards. Um, I believe there are a couple of wineries that are on their way to being certified carbon neutral. Um, we also have, um, I think, the U.S.'s first regenerative organic winery in Oregon as well, which is Troon Vineyard in uh, the Applegate Valley of Southern Oregon. And we have a very high percentage of Demeter certified vineyards as well. So biodynamic certified vineyards um, make up 50% uh, of the, um, the Demeter certified vineyards in the US. So 50% of those are in Oregon. Uh, we've also had a long history of working uh, to um, empower our vineyard stewards and protect our workers' families with Salude Auction, um, which happens every year. Uh, wineries donate barrels that uh, raise money for worker health care. Um, and then Ivoy is a recent um, player um, or introduction to the, to the uh, Willamette Valley wine community, which is um, bringing vineyard stewards from the vineyard uh, into the classroom, giving them a full um, uh, education on the business of Oregon wine and uh, giving them wine and spirit education trust certification uh, for level one as well. Uh, you can, there's a host of other uh, links there that you can um, look at as well, and I encourage you to do so. Uh, Oregon has the highest number of B Corporation certified wineries, and that's um, a certification where um, the winery and producer must make a commitment to its staff uh, in terms of um, healthy practices, providing 401k, um, and other, other um, commitments to, to their workers. Uh, question. Generally, if you want to work in a tasting room, it's always good to have, um, a, you know, some history in hospitality or be someone who loves people and loves to share stories. Um, you know, high quality, you know, high quality hospitality is always something um, that we're that every 
tasting room is looking for. Um, and then in addition, you know, some wine education is, you know, is recommended, but it's not essential. I think that, you know, a lot of people can teach wine education on the job. Uh, the Wine and Spirit Education Trust are also um, really good um, base level uh, certifications for tasting room sales as well, just to give you a good um, overall knowledge of the wine industry. And finally, uh, these figures I think could be updated. I think we're now sitting at 27% um, for retail volume growth um, in 2021. Um, so really, uh, you know, the while the price, the average bottle price for a bottle of Oregon wine is much higher than some of our counterparts here on the West Coast, um, we find that the consumers are really looking to trade up to that quality level and are happy to pay for uh, wines of quality and small production um, and that are made with integrity. And so uh, I urge you to keep that in mind when you're building out your wine lists or thinking of your next place to come and visit and spend a couple of days in wine country. Uh, I'm going to throw this back over to David and thank you, <laughs> thank you all for being here. And um, yeah, Tom, that's a really difficult question. I, I don't know that I have a favorite wine. It depends on the day and I try not to drink the same wine twice. <laughs> um, and please keep putting information in the chat and questions in the chat and please jump back in next Monday at the same time as we dive deep into the new AVAs of the Willamette Valley and into the rise of Chardonnay in the Willamette Valley. Thanks everyone for joining and David, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bree. Did a, did a great job. Lots of information and we look forward to continuing these series um, as we build up to Oregon Wine Month in May. Um, and just kind of want to make sure everybody is aware of our industry website where you can have access to lots of great information, presentations, um, and digital assets to promote Oregon Wine Month. Um, like we discussed, um, there is a toolkit that has presentations built in. Um, there's graphics that you can get linked to and just a variety of, of tools to help you promote Oregon wine through May. The Resource Studio is another awesome resource that we have. Um, Bree pulled some of the slides for her presentation from the Resource Studio. So there are presentations built for each ABA. There's presentations on labeling laws. Um, there's presentations on the history of Oregon, just a variety of resources that you can use and download to uh, promote Oregon wine and to educate yourself. Next slide, please. Sorry, I'm too busy typing in the chat. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of good questions. Um, I don't know, Bree, there's one question that kind of came up maybe once or twice regarding global warming and how it's affecting um, Oregon grapes, and po possibly changing the styles or maybe different varieties that are working better now with, with warmer temperature. Yeah, you know, I think the, I think the one thing that the founders of this industry were told, you know, 60 years ago when they came to Oregon was that they were mad for trying to grow and make wine in Oregon, that it was too rainy, that they were going to, you know, rot in their boots. Um, and so, you know, climate change is really um, for Oregon creating a lot of opportunity for us to uh, really plant a lot of different grape varieties um, for vineyards um, to be um, planted in higher elevations, uh, different sites, um, you know, moving, some may move to north uh, facing slopes as opposed to south um, or west. And so there's just a lot of opportunity that can be that can be found now because of the changing climate. Um, and we are definitely seeing a growth in, um, in alternative varieties here. Um, and, you know, and in the reliability of Pinot Noir um, being grown here. So I think we've had just a um, real 
wealth of great vintages um, for Pinot Noir, for Chardonnay, for Syrah, um, almost for, for every variety. Um, and it's really unstoppable what this industry is, is capable of. Um, and there's a real curiosity here. Um, and thankfully it's still, uh, you know, affordable enough for a lot of younger people to start getting into the industry here. And so we're seeing a lot of um, young people um, starting their own brands, um, starting brands in new AVAs or um, regions where they are parts of the AVA where they haven't really thought about before. So um, I would just say that climate change is definitely a positive um, for Oregon at the moment. Any other questions, David, that stood out? Um, no, we've been putting some links in the in the chat where you can access the, the toolkit that I discussed and then also for registration and where the recordings will live after we present. Um, Great. And, and as I mentioned um, in the toolkit, we do have the, the sales decks and a variety of assets that you can, you can get. So here's the link for you right here. Um, and then also one thing I wanna draw everybody's attention to is for those participating in all six of our webinars, we have an opportunity to further your education on Oregon wine with a partnership that we have with the Napa Valley Wine Academy. Um, they have an Oregon wine expert certification and we will be awarding a few attendees that participate in all of the webinars, which is a really great certification to build out your education on Oregon wine. <laughs> and I believe that is everything that I'd like to discuss. Brie, I don't know if there's any lingering questions or thoughts you have before we say goodbye. Uh, nope, but yeah, please. Um, uh, do you know how this recording is going to be sent out? Is it going to be sent to everyone who registered, David, or is it just going to be available on the website? It will be available on the registration site. So they'll, they'll pop up there. I put the link in the, in the chat. Great. So sign up for the next uh, seminar in the series. And as David mentioned, we have a really exciting certification program coming out um, with Napa Valley Wine Academy that we've worked on with them. Uh, and to be in the chance to uh, get a place in that certification, uh, you need to make sure that you register and uh, check out every seminar. So please join us for the next few. And uh, 